you've just landed inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. Hey, Launch Streeters, Tamara here, your host and that kid that rented out the clothing in her closet long before it was a thing. I was 14. It was the 80s. So let's just say that my jelly shoes were all the rage. <laughs> you know, being entrepreneurial and growing a business is it's tough work. And it got me thinking, what are those either big mistakes or the smart decisions that entrepreneurs make time and time again? I mean, I know we want to think we are, but we really aren't reinventing the wheel every time, right? So with that question, I brought on JJ Ramberg. You probably already know who she is. She's the host of MSNBC's Your Business. It's the show that focuses on businesses and entrepreneurship. She's the founder of GoodShop.com. She is also the author of the best-selling book, It's Your Business, 183 Tips That Will Transform Your Small Business. She also recently launched a podcast called Been There, Built That, where she interviewed leaders of billion-dollar businesses as well. I've listened to it. It's fantastic. So we had a great conversation about the challenges small businesses face today, how to break through that clutter. She talked a little bit about how as you grow your business, the risk actually increases, not decreases, something I'd never heard before. You know, she's helped thousands of businesses on her show, and we find out some of the stories that even surprised her, even with all that experience. This is a good one. So here we go. JJ, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me on. Me too. Yeah, this is going to be great. So let's get to know you. What's one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, I read the entire Game of Thrones series many, many years before it was on HBO. <laughs> no. So before you even knew it was going to be a TV show. Oh, long before. My husband and his best friend and his wife and I all read it. And we, for years, were talking about, oh, wouldn't this be a great movie? Oh, my gosh. And so... <laughs> And so do you really love that genre of books? Because that is a hefty commitment to read those books. Oh, I do. I love the Lord of the Rings books. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm nerdy. Well, my maiden name is Gondor. So every time we watch Lord of the Rings and they say to the land of Gondor, I really do feel the need to put my fist up in the air like that's oh, actually that's so my funny. place in Middle Earth. <laughs> That's so funny. I know. That's awesome. So here's why we wanted to have you on. So you're the host of MSNBC's Your Business, and you have had, I mean, it's probably fair to say thousands of small businesses on your show. So yep. I wanted to dig in kind of what you've learned, what advice you've given, what you've seen. And I wanted to start out with, were there any people or businesses that maybe their story, their pain, what they were going for just kind of surprised you? They weren't the everyday things that you hear. Um, you know, it's interesting because I started my own company a few months before uh, starting the show. So at the same time I've been running the show, I've also been running my company, Good Shop. And so nothing has surprised me because I've basically gone through it all at the same time um, as as I hear other people. And I, and I realize that there are these high highs and these low lows and that, and the one thing that all the successful people I see have in common is their ability to stay confident in those low moments. I love that you mentioned that because I, as an entrepreneur myself, feel that on a daily basis, maybe even sometimes on an hourly basis. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm totally like, woo, I'm amazing. I've landed the deal. This is all great. And then I'm like, oh my God, I can't do anything right. I'm going under and I can't pay my mortgage. Right. And it could be in the same day. Who knows? Exactly. What is that about? And how, like, when you said those successful people actually stay confident during both, how do you do that? Because sometimes I find with, um, especially people who are more, I think, um, innovatively driven, when we're high, we forget that we're low. And when we're low, we forget that we were high at some point. Yeah. So I, I um, have been really focused on this because I think it's really interesting for people to hear um, 
about how people get through the low moments, right? Success yeah. is easy. You get it's success is great. fun. Yeah, it's fun. Everyone wants to be a part of what you're doing. And so when things are not going well, I always ask entrepreneurs this. And and what's really been interesting is um, what I have found. And and so my my show focuses on small, medium sized businesses. I have this podcast, been there, built that, which. Um, it just as of late, coincidentally, I've, I've interviewed all these people who run these billion dollar businesses. Um, and, and what I hear large and small is just this, this belief in themselves. And so that, you know, and it may be because of the way they were raised. It could be because of some kind of experience they went through when they were younger. Um, a, a, a belief in themselves that, hey, I can get through this even though I know it's really hard. Um, and B some perspective on I'm willing to take the risk to keep this going, not throw in the towel because it feels riskier to not take it. Mm. Well, that's just what I keep hearing over and over again. And, you know, it's easy to say that when you're a startup because when you're a startup, it's frankly not as risky, especially if you you know don't have kids um, and and you don't have huge debt or you're not caring for other family members or something, right? It's okay. So if I fail, then so what? Or I'll I, just go get a I job. failed. I'll go get a job. Exactly. It obviously changes as you get um, larger, but um, I do think that idea of okay, what the, the the opportunity cost of not trying this just seems much bigger to me than giving it a shot. So very quickly for definition for the audience, just if they haven't seen your show yet, define small and mid-size that comes on your show just so they have some context. Yeah, I know because everyone defines it differently. Yeah. I mean, so on my show, we'll do everything from startup businesses all the way to $100 million companies. And that's that's about where it stops. Then we have a part called Learning from the Pros, um, where we talk to, to very successful founders and CEOs as well. Will you dig into what you just said a little bit? So you said something that I've actually never, I've actually never heard articulated before, because I think we, we spend so much time focusing and putting the spotlight on that startup, that big new idea that they're all, I, I work out of one of the WeWorks, so I see these guys all the time, right? They're like, they're f eight of them in a two-person office, right? It's yep. at that stage. <laughs> but you yep. said the risk actually increases and changes as you get larger. And I think I personally am, am dealing with that right now as our business has kind of, you know, moved up the food chain. Will you talk about that? Because I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard that before. Well, it does because, you know, in some ways it feels like it's less because you have something established, right? You're not starting from, from scratch, but at that point you have employees and you have other people's livelihoods yeah. and you have an ego attached to what you have built already. So, um, and also you have something to lose. When you are just starting up something, you just don't have that much to lose. I just interviewed John Foley, who's the founder, one of the founders of Peloton. Um, and he, he was amazing and so incredibly honest about what he's gone through. But he said he was having a hard time getting money up until just, you know, about four or four months ago. And he felt at that point, OK, now at this point, if we fail, it is just such a high profile failure. Right. And I have all these I have all these people working for me and depending on me. It's very different than, you know, the first days when you just had this idea and got, you know, but also he's got all this investor money. Right. So he's then failed them, too. Versus in the beginning, you're just failing yourself. Yeah, right. Which. It sounds horrible in itself, but really what you're saying there is so important for launch shooters out there to hear around the risk in some ways gets easier. Like to your point, you have resources, you have a team, but it also gets higher because you have resources and you have a team. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what kinds of challenges do the small businesses that come on your show face? And maybe there's some themes along the way that you've seen. I'd love to learn some of those lessons along with you when they, you know, they come on those challenges. Um, a lot of them are, I mean, God, they run the gamut, but, um, I'll talk about a few of them. Hiring is incredibly hard. And I know this myself too, from the early days of hiring for good shop. It's just getting great people in the door is everything. And not everyone is very good at it first time around. It's definitely a learned skill for many of us. Um, and firing also a learned skill and you have to learn to be a little bit ruthless with it, not ruthless in how you treat people, but ruthless in how you make the decision. Um, and so hiring, I think getting money is an issue of course, but I think more the questions around how to get money when you're talking about the early, early startup phase, 
I think most of the issues people deal with are just knowing what the issues are. Right. So I, I had this woman um, come to, uh, she, she was a glam squad person because uh, I was doing a shoot the other day in California and she had this really neat idea for an app. And her first idea was, okay, I've got to go get this patented. And I said to her, I don't think you need to go get a patent. You're going to spend all this time and potentially money getting this patented. But she's just heard the word patent and intellectual property and all this stuff so long that she felt like I have to go do this instead of just realizing I just need to go launch this. I don't actually have that much that needs to be protected here, but I need to go get it out the door and start you know, building the thing and getting partnerships, et cetera. You know, I'm intrigued to hear you say that because I get asked that question a lot of, or I guess it's more of a comment of, well, I have a patent on it. I'm like, well, what are you doing with it? <laughs> so having the patent is great, but are you actually doing anything with it? Why, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Why, why doesn't that matter? Why go to launch? Why would that be your advice? Well, this was a, her particular product. I would say go to launch. There'd be different different opinions based on different kinds of companies and what you can actually patent. But I think it's important for people to understand if you get a patent on something, do you have the money to defend that patent, right? So if you don't, then no point in having a patent. I mean, it, it, you know, again, it's so case dependent. A patent might be very important for you in, in order to sell your business later on, but not everything needs to be protected in that way, right to launch. And to your point, if you can't defend it, Mm, I'm not sure how important it is, but also too, I, I don't know, it's my belief that you have to create a defendable business. So technology is so hard these days because so many people come up with so many things that could infringe on your area, but it's pretty easy for them to do. Same with products, actually. It's true in consumer products too. Um, there's so much more that has to go into launching a, a product of any kind. Absolutely. And if you can build market share quickly, yeah. there's your protection as well. What what is some of the innovation and advice you've given to these small businesses over the years that you think has really resonated that we need to hear? I think that you should think about innovation not just as product innovation but process innovation as well. I think you need to take a good look at your – well, there are a few things actually. I mean there are so many. Gosh. Yeah. So one of them is you need to go – and take a good look at how everything is working in your company. Do basically an audit. And is everything working as well as it could be? Because when you're just starting up, you're just getting stuff done, right? And then you start adding people, and then you start adding process, and then you add layers and layers and layers. And at some point, you need to realize, do I need to strip some of those layers? And if we just added things to add them and made things more complicated than they need to be. And so you just, you just need to strive for simplicity as you grow, um, number one. And also as you grow, you need to, and this seems so obvious, um, but I realized in my own company, you always need to realize as you grow that new people coming in are not the people who started there. And you have to make sure that the goals of the company are very clear to everyone. And there was a time at, at Good Shop in my company where I thought they were, right? It's very obvious what we do. Or a coup, you know, we provide coupons, online coupons. And our North Star seemed very obvious to me what we do. But there were a lot of kind of nuances along the way that people felt differently about. And we realized this and, and had a big all hands or rather at our all hands meeting that we always had. We, we made it very clear, okay, here, here is our where we want to get to. Here is our path to getting there. And then, by the way, repeat it back. So that we're sure that what we said, you believe also, you know, and, and, and it, it, this sounds very didactic. It wasn't quite as dictatorial <laughs> as I'm saying now. It was, it was a very fun conversation with everyone. But, but make sure that what you're saying is the same thing that people are hearing and that everyone's on board. It, it makes it, you know, much more fun to run your company that way. And it is 100% necessary. I want to dig into two things on this one before we move on to other advice, because I think it's so powerful. Um, you know, you had said that the people that you started with, you know, may not be the people moving forward. And I've always been a firm believer in that, that your A players at one level aren't necessarily your A players at another level. No fault of their own. They're just not the right fit as you grow and change. And you had mentioned earlier about you have to be ruthless and firing, not about how you treat people, but just about the decision. Why is that so important? And what's the impact when we let people who aren't the right fit linger? Well, I'll use myself as an example. So when I graduated um, from grad school, I went to work for a company called cooking.com. 
And there were, it was 1998. There were five of us working there, and I was head of marketing and business development, which is like the head, you know, the title that right. the MBA got <laughs> at an internet great, company though. in those days. <laughs> right, but I had never, I'd never even worked in business, let alone done marketing business development. I'd been a journalist before business school, and I worked, you know, one summer internship was my whole experience. But I was head of marketing and biz dev. Um, and then we grew, we were five people when I got there and I, I did a lot and I did as much as I could do. But as the company grew, we needed experience. Suddenly we were doing direct marketing. We had a catalog, we were doing these big, big deals. And I was making it up as I was going along and doing a fine job. But as we got more money and earned more money, they had to hire someone over me. And so that's a question at that point for me, do I want to stay right with a new layer in between me and the CEO? Um, but it's a question for them. Like, let's just take a hard look at JJ who has zero experience in this world and say, she's done a great job, but everything, you know, where at the stage we are today, we could get a lot more done a lot quicker. If we bring in someone who understands this world, there's just no learning curve. Uh, you know, for launch readers out there listening, I would just pay attention really here to what JJ is saying about, you know, are the right people in the right roles, which I think we've heard. But I think, you know, what you're really saying is it's okay to recognize that people don't always go with you as the company, your team, the brand, whatever it is, changes and grows, that you might need to make some adjustments along the way. And that's that's actually best for everybody. Um, I think the lingering is where it gets really bad because then, you know, you don't meet expectations, you're frustrated, your leadership is frustrated with you, whether that's one person or 20, nobody wins. Nobody wins. It's terrible for everyone. It ruins the culture of your company. People start to get resentful. It's a, it's a terrible idea to not let people go when they're not in the right job. So the second part I wanted to ask you about is the goals, because I just, I think that's so key as you grow as, as a as a business. And it's one of those things, too, as you said, that kind of along the way, suddenly there's all these nuances to the goals that you as the founder said. And you're like, well, isn't it obvious? I mean, I say it every day, but <laughs> yep. you know, it changes. So how do you, how do you set goals in a way that, um, as you said, it is repeatable back, like people get it, they're on board. And then how do you make sure that as you grow the new people kind of come into that fold versus having to realize every couple of years, oh my God, now we're off track with the goals because we're all doing different things. It's a conversation and it's, and it's repeated in every meeting, right? Every manager meeting, every meeting managers have with their team. It's just repetition over and over and over again. And also um, talking about how whatever you are doing today fits into that goal. Always refer back to the goals. So that people understand what they are. I love that. To doing today fits into goals. So all the little things, all the big things. Yeah, I mean, even so on, on our show, on your business, on MSNBC, right? We, we, we are entertainment, of course, in some ways because we're on MSNBC. But, um, and it's a television show. But also we serve business leaders and decision makers. So whenever we do a piece... We aren't saying, hey, is this kind of a entertaining founder story piece that might be on, for example, the Today Show, right? No, we're looking at what, what is our audience going to take from this? And we talk about who our audience every time. And it's, it can be subtle, right? There's still, there's still stories about businesses, but it, in that we are defining our particular audience in a particular way defines what kinds of stories we put on the show. That's cool. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, especially because you've seen so many businesses, what do you think it takes to break through the noise? I think just especially given how fast paced and cluttered and competitive really the marketplace is today. I think you really have to have something good. You know, I think ultimately products speak for themselves. And if you have a really good product, people will talk about it. I, I don't think you can have an okay product and get it talked about. And then after that, I think you have to figure out how to market it. I think I think a great product will take you so far and then and then you know it gets you from A to B and then to really make it big, you you have to spend some money on marketing it or come up with some amazing campaign. So that I'm not being assumptive, when you say it has to be good, can you give me an example of one and why you think it's good? I'd love for our audience to really understand what what it means because let's face it, we all think that our ideas are brilliant. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing, right? So what does it really take to be good? Well, 
I don't know if everyone really thinks that. I, I think that sometimes people cut some corners around things and they realize they're cutting some corners, but they think it's kind of good enough. Mm. Now, obviously, there's minimum viable product, et cetera, and you want to get stuff out and get it tested. So um, it's two different things. But I think you have to. And I think also sometimes, yes, we sit around in our conference rooms and we have this amazing idea and. Um, we think it's going to be great. I mean, I know that at Good Shop, we launched some things that we thought were going to be great, and they weren't. We didn't kill them off fast enough, um, but we eventually killed them off because you have to. Um, so I think you know if it's good if you're getting it by by just simply your customer feedback, um, consumer feedback to stuff. You can figure out rather quickly whether you have something good or not. Um, sorry, now I forgot your question. <laughs> oh, just about what it takes to be good. I mean, is it, is it really... Oftentimes I find that um, there are businesses out there that have good products. I'm just not convinced they serve a real need. So they go so far because some people will buy it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really solve a problem or create a new behavior. It just, you know, and I think that a lot of us as business owners, and I, I think I fall into this trap too, sometimes think this idea is like whatever it is we're launching is brilliant and, and it falls short and we've missed a key piece of the puzzle. Right. Well, then it's all about talking to. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the real example from Good Shop. So we, when we launched the company, um, we had good search. So every time you did a search, a penny went to your favorite cause. And then um, it, it took off wildly. And so we were like, this is great. Okay, now let's launch Good Shop, which is what exists still now, which is coupons, um, a coupon aggregator. But then that was working really well. So we thought, okay, let's launch good dining. And every time you dine out, money goes to your cause. And good trial pay, where every time you try something, money goes to your cause. And um, good, oh my God, we had so many things. And we thought it was a great idea, right? There are all these extensions on this idea that we have. Um, and so we launched all of them. And it was very easy to know that it didn't work because no one did it. <laughs> Right. And in the end, the one that people were really interested in were the coupons for Good Shop. And so we killed off all the other products. And that is what the company is now. Um, just Good Shop, which is, you know, been successful itself. But but, you know, again, we thought we thought these things were going to be great. We would not have spent the time and money launching them if we didn't think so. But we were absolutely wrong. <laughs> it is amazing how in a conference room an idea can seem brilliant. <laughs> like absolutely like this is clearly the money shot. And then you get out in the marketplace and it's like wah wah. <laughs> totally. And by the way, not even in the conference room, right? In some focus groups yeah. that we did and some other stuff, people said that it was great because it sounded great, right? It all sounded easy. But it really when you get it into people's hands and they actually have to, in our case, do it. In other cases, you know, put down money to buy it that is when the rubber meets the road and you know the truth. Well, that is so true. I mean, I, I think you really don't know the viability of an idea until you find out if people will take action or open up their wallets for it. Exactly. And focus exactly. groups are very, I've spent 20 years doing focus groups and it used to drive me crazy because, you know, they would give you this amazing feedback. And I just, I knew, like, I just, I knew in my gut that the minute I put that in the grocery store, it was not happening. They weren't going to pick it up, but they it's, would be like, I give it an eight. <laughs> <laughs> unless I have to pay for it. Right. Totally. Unless, <laughs> right. And I don't think people are liars. I think, you know, we think no, our I best think selves. they don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. Also, you want to be positive. People want to give positive feedback. It's human nature. Yeah. You know, but that thing you said earlier, and we were kind of just talking about, about killing them off. I mean, isn't that really a part of the process? Not everything you launch can, can just crush it out of the gate. Oh, yeah. And you, and, you know, you have to be ruthless about killing things, too, um, if they're not working. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, innovation has to be thought of beyond just the product, but really about the business approach. Why do you think that's so important to success? Because uh, ultimately, everything that you put out has to do with the people in your office and uh, office and the process you have for getting things done. And so, you know, some of the best, I, I interviewed this, um, it was a, a um, I guess kind of a plumbing company in New Jersey. And what made them so successful was not that they were better at coming to your house and fixing whatever was wrong than anyone else. It was the way they did it, right? The, the way that the um, technicians treated the customers, the way the whole customer experience was great and the whole way the employees were treated by the company was great. And that's what set them apart from everyone else. So your competitive advantage in the marketplace can be how you do something, not what you actually do or provide. Absolutely. Hmm, yeah. So interesting. And that's exactly what they had going for them. 
I mean, think about Zappos, right? Yeah. Think about what Zappos did. They're, you know, yes, it was different because you could buy shoes online, but it was really their customer service that changed everything. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think with Zappos, I could have gone anywhere. I could have gone to Nordstrom or to any of the other websites, but I went there because it was so pleasant to do. And I knew there was no risk because of the customer service. And now the irony I think of that is every other online store that I go to, I expect to treat me the way Zappos does. And when they don't, I'm always disappointed. (laughs) Right. They set the bar very high. Yeah, they, they did. really did. Um, I want to go back to your podcast because you said you recently launched that, the Been There, Built That. Did I hear you right that that is in, in that podcast, you're interviewing um, CEOs and leaders at billion dollar companies? I have. <laughs> Just, I mean, we did not set out to do it. Not all of them. But um, yeah, so we, John Foley of Peloton and then Neil Blumenthal from Warby Parker and Jamie Kern Lima from It Cosmetics. I mean, they're all enormous companies. I just did also Katrina Markoff from Vos of Chocolat, who, a, a smaller company, but just a lovely and incredibly honest founder. What do you think that those founders and those companies have in common? It goes back to this real belief in themselves, right? And it's and it is by no means that they do not go through hard times. And I really push them on the hard times because I really am like to understand, you know, in the darkest days when you've made the biggest mistake or you can't get funding and everything's falling apart, how do you wake up the next morning and keep going? And all of them have just this, like, underneath it all, a confidence in themselves. And that, and and again, what I said before, this idea that it, it's, it's, so what, if, if it all falls apart, so what, right? If I have to, as John Foley told me, you know, we, we went down and looked. He's a Peloton founder. I talked with my wife and said, okay, if this all fails and we go, what happens? We have to pull our kids out of private school. We have to move um, in with your mother in her basement. Is that that bad? You know, it's yeah. not fun. It's not, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're still alive and we're healthy. In my darkest days, I like to look up the process for being an Uber driver because I think at the end of the day, I could do that. Well, that's the thing, right? You just think about the the scariest moments suddenly don't seem as scary if you kind of unwrap them oftentimes. Now, just on that note, would you mind sharing kind of what your darkest day was and how you pulled yourself out of it? Huh, my darkest day. That's a good question in work. I can't think of one particular one, but you know what I have is I have a co-founder, um, which is my brother, Ken. Um, and now we have actually a great CEO who runs the company too. And what I found, it's interesting because I spoke yesterday to the founders of Rodan and Fields. This mm-hmm. They do a billion dollars in revenue with the They're skincare huge, company. Yeah. They're huge. Um, and they had the same thing as me, which which was having a co-founder in our both our cases is amazing because if I'm having a day that's hard, weirdly, my brother is always having a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that and, good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good, right? Because if I'm saying, oh, this is so hard, he's like, ah, oh, companies can do great. And we have all these great things coming up. And if he's ever having a day where it's like, oh, should we have done that? I happen to weirdly be in this really great space where I'm like, I can't believe we're doing this. And look what's coming up ahead. And it is not, it's not like we're trying to boost each other up ever. It is, it's some like karmic, something in the air Karmic's probably the wrong word. Some, I don't know, something where it's all balanced out. So when someone's feeling low, the other person's feeling high, and it and it just works out. And again, it's we're not making, we're not trying to cheer each other up. It's really the moment, the thing we're feeling in the moment. Well, that's way better than my dog, who I love, but she doesn't talk back. Like I have to pretend she's saying those things to me. <laughs> I mean, she's ninety pounds of love, but I'm like, Zoe, come on, tell me it's going to be okay. Don't tell me gonna I'm be just going to, yeah, I'm going to be an Uber me, driver. Yeah, I I don't think I could have done this alone. I think that for my personality, I needed a co-founder. How come? Because I need that person to, to, I feel like I am going through this with. And, right, I need that person who, if I'm, if I'm having a hard time, is having a good time and, and to, to hear it out. I just, I think for me, I just. I, I I like sharing this whole experience with someone. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, and I think when I look at kind of the businesses that I admire and, you know, maybe try to emulate, they tend to have a really strong leadership team, if not partners. 
Yeah, I do too. Well, yeah, for sure, team companies that succeed and are good have strong leadership teams. You can't do anything without that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I learned that the hard way. I think that's one of the small business challenges is we bottleneck. We, we say we don't have enough resources, so we can't you know, afford a team, and then we can't do everything. We're not good at everything. And then that kind of keeps us at a certain level. Absolutely. So before I get to the last questions, where can people go to learn more and connect with you? Um, okay, so the podcast has been there, built that. The TV show is Your Business, which airs on MSNBC on uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings at 7.30 Eastern. Um, my company is called goodshop.com. And then, uh, oh, I wrote a book. I just wrote a book. If you have kids, called The Startup Club. Oh, is it for kids? Um, it is. It's for, it's for grammar school kids, and it's a fiction book about kids who start businesses. Very cool. So tell me a little bit about it. I have kids, so go on. How old are they? Nine and 13. Oh, okay. It's perfect for your nine-year-old. So I have kids who are eight, nine, and 10. And they're, and they're entrepreneurs. I'm sure your kid is yep. too, because all of them are. All yes, kids are entrepreneurs. They're naturally. There were no, yeah, there were no books about kids who start businesses. I couldn't believe it. No modern ones. Wow. And so, I know, go to the bookstore. I was, I was shocked. I did not set out to go write a book. I literally went, just, I just wanted to go buy one. Um, and there weren't any. So uh, I, my sister and I, and then a friend of ours who is an actual children's writer, since I'm not, <laughs> um, worked together to, to write this book called The Startup Club, where, you know, a group of kids start businesses and they go through all of the things that grownups do. And very subtly, your kids learn, as I always say, when they finish the book, they'll realize that when they have to, uh, when they have a lemonade stand, they have to pay someone back for the lemons. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, I just had that um, conversation with my 13 year old who said he wanted to go around the neighborhood and do, you know, pet sitting and walking and all that. And I said, great, you need flyers or something. He goes, great. Can, can we go do that? And I was like, right, but you need to pay for the printing of those flyers, said flyers. Right. He's like, what? I do. <laughs> So funny. Well, that's cool that you started that. And wow, what a great example, JJ, of I think where a lot of brilliant ideas come from, which is why can't I find this? Why can't I solve this? Why is it this way? And that tends to build, I think, the most brilliant businesses out there. I do too. I do too. You know there's a problem out there. Yeah. So you have a lot of really interesting things going on. What are you really excited about moving forward? Hmm. Um, big picture, I don't know. Small picture, I'm, I've been super excited about the book and the podcast. I think they're because they're the, the new things that I have going on. Actually, we're about to relaunch the Good Shop site too. That's pretty exciting. Oh, a good website relaunch is always exciting. It is. It's, well, that's one of the painful lessons I think I learned along the way, that a website isn't a one-time point-in-time exercise. Oh, gosh, <laughs> That it no. constantly has to be revised. <laughs> Absolutely. So much. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have this great team working there now, too. So it's very fun. Do you think now is a good time to start a business, grow a business or not? And if so, why? I think any time is. Right. I mean, some of the greatest businesses happen out of recessions when you think it might not be a good time. I mean, there's just there's no right time. There's no wrong time. If there is a business a problem out there that needs to be solved, go for it. And I really for launch readers out there, I want you to think about what JJ said earlier in relation to this, which is what's really the risk of doing it or growing it, whichever place that you're in, given if you unpack it to your point, you know, maybe you're living in the basement or driving Uber like that's not so bad. It could be worse. Right. I mean, I think the real thing is to, to decide yourself, is it that bad, right? Mm. And if it is, well, then you know that and you know what to do with that. And if it's not, then you know that and you know what to do with it. Yeah, that's great. So what is one kind of final piece of advice you would have for launch traders out there who are looking to uh, grow their businesses? Get a, a team of people um, around you who can give you advice because you m so many things about starting a business or growing a business, you do not need to reinvent the wheel. So for instance, when I was trying to figure out, this was long ago, obviously, because the company's 12 years old now, but when I was trying to figure out how to give my employees health care, yeah. right, I could have spent probably months researching it, or I could have called my friend Matt, who had done this a year before and said, what'd you do? Right. And what are the, you know, what are the pros and cons? And he told me and I copied it, right? So there are so many ways that you can shortcut your learning curve by just asking someone. So I'm going to ask a really naive question because I know it's what some launch readers out there are thinking. How do you find those people if you don't have them in your network already, if you're missing a piece of that? And how do you how do you ask them in a way that doesn't feel like, can I pick your brain for nothing in return? 
I don't think people mind getting their brain picked for nothing in return, by the way. I think people, if they've done it, really like giving advice. I mean, if you had asked me what PEO um, at the payroll company, healthcare company to choose after I had chosen mine, I would have been so happy to tell you because I just learned it myself and I was so excited that I knew the answer. Yeah. So I, I think that if you ask someone very something very specific – that, that they don't have to take too much time to think about or ask or answer. I think people are really happy to help. And how um, do you find them? And so how do you find them? Um, through friends of friends. I know a, a guy I know, um, he goes on LinkedIn every two weeks, randomly, I mean, sort of, sort of cold email someone on LinkedIn and said, will you have a coffee with me? Wow. Um, and it doesn't always work, he says, but sometimes it does. I think if you go to networking events, you always meet people at those events and then you can become friends with them or say, hey, do you mind having a coffee? And by the way, sometimes hot coffee is a high bar. It's always best to do stuff in person. Sometimes you can just, hey, hey, if I, I know you were just doing this thing on healthcare. Would you mind if I called you for 10 minutes and heard what you did? And then you start to develop a relationship with them. There are also organizations out there like EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, et cetera, that you can join. Industry organizations are always, I found those always to be great. It sounds very unsexy, but we're all there. So like, of course, come. Um, and I think what you said that was really important about like sometimes coffee can be a high price, but like I love, I will absolutely give anyone advice if I can do it on my way to the airport because I have the time, I'm willing to give you the information and it's not getting in the way of anything else. So, cause I'm not working. So exactly. I love it. Exactly. Like, please, yes, I will happily talk to you. Like when I'm in line or going to the airport. <laughs> and I do feel like sometimes people feel like it needs to be a coffee or a lunch or something, but it just doesn't right. Yeah. It, a phone call. Um, I, I, you know, people are just as happy to give advice over the phone. Yeah. And to your point, like it's coffee can, coffee's amazing. And you got to start <laughs> maybe with a five minute phone call. <laughs> yep. All right. This has been so great, JJ. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Uh, no, I don't think so. This was a really fun Good. chat. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been, this has been so insightful. And for Launch Read out there, just a couple key things to point out. The whole idea that innovation isn't just about the product. I could not agree more. You got to think about how your entire business is going to market and, um, and all the conversation around kind of what to do to get to the next level. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Before you go. I have to share my big aha from this episode with you. It's kind of around mindset. It's the idea that you believe that it's riskier not to do it. So that people who are entrepreneurial look at not just the risk of doing it, but actually what's the risk of not doing it? And they feel like that outweighs the risk of taking that action and maybe even failing. So here's the action I want you to take. The next time you are struggling with moving an idea forward, maybe it's uncomfortable to present it, even more uncomfortable to do it, to launch it, I want you to stop and think about the risks of not doing it. We don't spend nearly enough time thinking about that. We always think about the risks of what it's going to, ha what happens if it fails? What happens if it doesn't work? What happens if we don't achieve success? That's what we think about. But we definitely do not think about, well, what's the risk of not doing this? Do we get left behind? Do we miss out? Do I not go after my dreams and always have regret? That's the thing I want you to start asking yourself. What's the risk of not doing it? Tamara out. Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on go to launchstreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to launchstreet.com.